Okay, the next item of business is debate on motion 6898 in the name of Mark Griffin on cost of living mortgage uh, rescue scheme. I'd invite members who wish to participate to press the request to speak buttons now or as soon as possible or put uh, RTS in the chat function if they're joining us online. Uh, again, we're tight for time, so I'd encourage members to stick to their time allocations. And with that, I call Mark Griffin to speak to and move the motion uh, for around six minutes, Mr Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, last month, this Parliament used its powers to support renters struggling with the cost of living, freezing rents and banning evictions, providing a lifeline to thousands of families this, this winter. And because it's our job to prevent a tidal wave of repossessions, homelessness and financial misery, we are calling on the Government to support homeowners with mortgages to revamp its own mortgage to shared equity scheme. 30% of all Scots, half of homeowners, still have a mortgage. Prices for energy, food and fuel have gone through the roof for them, just like anyone else. And now they face a Tory premium on interest rates too. Officer, the Government should not need convincing that more help to keep people in their homes um, is needed. And to its credit, the Scottish Government has kept open its mortgage to, scare, to shared equity scheme which could, which could help. Um, Citizens Advice Scotland evidence, which the Government cited in support of the Tenant Protection Act, shows that by June, views of the What to Do If You Can't Pay Your Mortgage webpage increased over, um, by over 1,600 per cent in a single year. And it's not just um, people looking for advice when fixed rate deals come to an end either. For the estimated 200,000 Scottish homeowners on variable rate mortgages, this will have been a, a terrible year so far, and that pain isn't over. Just last week, the, the OBR forecast the effective rate on existing mortgages would rise to 4.3 per cent by summer 2023. Its shelter and crisis put the cost of rehoming a household at around £15,000, mm -hmm. with the costs escalating for those with greater support needs. But the, the cost of families' livelihoods, the well-being, the mental health, the impact on children losing their homes are far, far greater, far, far longer uh, lasting. And the, the existing mortgage to shared equity scheme is one of last resort. The final option for a family at risk of losing their home after all other options are exhausted, where they can then ask government to take a stake in their home, reduce their monthly costs to be bought back when their, families, uh, their family finances um, allow. But it's just not delivering. It doesn't serve homeowners in today's market. There hasn't been a successful application to that scheme since 2016. Property thresholds haven't been updated since 2017. Applications to the sister mortgage to rent scheme took at least a year to process in the last financial year, with only 41% of those successful. And all the while, ministers have renewed budgets of millions that have gone unspent for years. It seems like a slush fund that is to be raided for wider budget pressures on a yearly basis. Mm -hmm. President officer, the, the Cabinet Secretary's amendment notes that the scheme is demand-led, and that's absolutely true. But the scheme itself seems to be designing out demand. Yeah. Now, we are proposing that the mortgage to shared equity scheme is overhauled to deliver a true safety net for those at risk. Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. I mean, the member is well aware, as he note, that we are currently reviewing the fund, including the eligibility rules for both mortgage to shared equity and mortgage to rent. So the very issues that he is raising uh, are already being looked at. Do you not accept that? Mark Griffin. Yeah. I, I fully accept that there is a review and you know, I'm going to come on to, to talk to that um, in a minute, but I would suggest then it should be fairly simple. Since, since that review has been going on since the summer, it would be fairly simple for the government to accept our proposals yeah. and expand that safety net um, for people, because we are proposing that the, the mortgage to shared equity scheme is overhauled. Um, it needs overhauled urgently, 
um, to deliver that, that true safety net for those at risk of losing their homes um, amid the, the Tory economic crisis. When circumstances change so must the, the policy, and those circumstances have most definitely changed. You just need to ask anyone um, out there and you'd find out how stretched family budgets are right now. Uh, as an absolute minimum, the overhaul needs to cater to a wider group in today's market. You'd be absolutely hard-pressed to find a, a single property um, in Lothians, Highlands, rural Scotland areas with the highest price-to-income ratios which could get help under the current scheme. Now, firstly, property values must rise. They're far too low. The government's existing thresholds based on house size um, are complex and we feel if they can't be revised quickly, they should instead rely on median house price data for each local authority. Um, secondly, um, existing equity requirements exclude far too many. The current 20 per cent minimum would mean that just 58 per cent of mortgages would be eligible. Now, a, a revised scheme must ensure that recent first-time buyers with far less equity who might be rolling off their, their very first fixed rate can still access support. Uh, and thirdly, the scheme must be resourced to be responsive. Turning around applications in two months, not years. People have already lost their home by that time. Yep. Um, I don't the, know no, the member is just winding up, oh, right, Mr okay. Griffin. Thanks, thanks President Officer. Um, I, I do feel that the, the Cabinet Secretary in our amendment misjudges um, the level of financial trauma already taking place across Scotland. It's not just households with lowest incomes who are struggling. The, the, the system needs to be ready for people's financial hardship. And we know that there is a review underway that is um, being ongoing for a number of months. I hope that the Government will set out the scope of that review, the deadline for Im implementing changes and rule out a closure of the mortgage to shared equity um, scheme. The, the Tories absolutely need to fix the mess that they have made, but it is not enough for Government to just criticise for, from the sidelines. We need to use the powers that we have here in Scotland to help families keep their own homes, and I move the, the motion in my name. Thank you, Mr Griffin. I do apologise, as ever with these debates, we are tight for time, so you'll need to accommodate the uh, uh, interventions broadly within your speaking allocations. I call the Minister to speak to and move Amendment uh, 6898.2. Uh, Mr McPherson, for up to five minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. And of course, as Mark Griffin has alluded to, we are living through a cost of living crisis exacerbated by the impacts of UK government decisions and policies, including Brexit and the recent economic mismanagement through the summer which are resulting in soaring inflation and interest rates, including on mortgages, uh, which are affecting many homeowners. And it is in this context uh, that we welcome today's constructive debate and that Labour have chosen to use their time for this. Our demand-led homeowner support fund is the only such scheme in the UK. It provides support to low-income house owners who have fallen behind on their mortgages uh, and face repossession. The fund consists of the mortgage to rent and mortgage to shared equity schemes, uh, sitting alongside advice services uh, and legal aid support for homeowners. For clarity, as has been mentioned, this is a scheme of last resort, and every application is carefully considered to offer tailored support and allows us to provide the most suitable option to homeowners experiencing financial difficulties. Oh, briefly. Daniel Johnson. I am very grateful to the Minister for giving way. Uh, given that there has not been a successful application since 2016, is there any insight as to why that has occurred and any reflection from the Government on that point? Minister. We will we'll cover that, of course, in the review that the Cabinet Secretary has mentioned, but in order to maximise this support, we are currently undertaking those considerations and will conclude in the spring uh, on the eligibility rules and property value thresholds. Um, for clarity as well, the scheme relies on cooperation from landlords, lenders and those undertaking conveyancing, uh, which is, is really important with regard to Labour's suggestion of a two-month turnaround, because uh, that is unachievable regardless of resourcing or funding from government, because it is relying on other partners, uh, particularly, for example, the legal profession, which we know um, had high pressure on it in recent years because of the demand in the housing market. So uh, it's important for that wider context. Brilliant officer, our priority is to help those most in need, and help to buy evaluations showed that 80 per cent of participants would have been able to purchase a property which met their needs without financial assistance. 
Um, and therefore, with regard to the Conservative amendment, which we are urging Parliament to reject, cuts to financial transactions by the UK Government means reopening help to buy would have to be at the expense of delivering other affordable housing. And this is not a choice we are willing to make. What's more, presiding officer, we recognise the huge pressure the cost crisis is placing on households who rent their home, which is why, of course, we took action as a government through our emergency legislation, uh, which Parliament supported. And as colleagues know, uh, the Cost of Living Tenant Protection Scotland Act provides a temporary rent freeze and moratorium on evictions. It protects tenants by putting in place measures to stabilise immediate housing costs and en enable them to, to stay in their homes. Uh, I'm a bit pushed for time, but I'm sure you'll be able to speak. Um, moreover, um, for many households who are struggling to meet their housing costs, of course, uh, discretionary housing payments uh, are a lifeline that this government uh, funds. That, um, providing £86.6 uh, million pounds, uh, to local authorities this year. And this, of course, mitigates against the benefit, uh, the benefit cap and the bedroom tax um, Mitigations we wish we weren't having to undertake, uh, but we are taking uh, that action to support people and have done for several years uh, when it, with regard to the, the bedroom tax. The fact that we need to invest this money uh, at all shows that the UK government's welfare system continues to be uh, badly designed and wrong-headed, uh, and that is why we continue to push for the UK government to reverse uh, these policies uh, and to stop putting people at risk of homelessness. In contrast, of course, Social Security Scotland is now successfully de delivering 12 devolved benefits, uh, in including seven which are only available uh, in Scotland, not available elsewhere in the UK, uh, including, of course, the Scottish Child Payment. Uh, and from uh, next year, February 2023, our 13th benefit, our new winter heating payment, backed by £20 million, will provide around 400,000 people on low incomes uh, with a reliable annual £50 towards the costs of heating their homes in the winter. Uh, and this, of course, is uh, part of the allocation of almost £3 billion in this financial year to help mitigate the increased costs of living, uh, with over a billion of that support only available in Scotland. Uh, and so, as a government, we welcome today's debate and look forward to listening to the contributions from colleagues. Uh, and so I move the amendment in the Cabinet Secretary's name. Thank you very much, uh, Minister. I now call on Miles Briggs to speak to and move Amendment uh, 6898.1 uh, for up to four minutes. Mr. Thank Briggs. you, uh, Deputy President Officer, and I move Amendment in my name. And can I start by thanking the Labour Party for bringing forward uh, the debate today to the Chamber? Because I always welcome the opportunity to debate housing policy. And given the housing crisis that we do face in Scotland, it's clear that we do need to see action from both the UK and Scottish governments to support homeowners and those seeking the dream of home ownership as well. Like countries around the world, the UK is facing a profound economic challenge as a result of President Putin's illegal invasion of Ukraine and the recovery from the COVID pandemic. That seems to have been overlooked by both the Labour motion and the Minister's comments, and I think uh, that is disappointing. But Deputy Sign Off, as the fact is, this SNP government have failed to address Scotland's housing crisis, which has made it harder for people to get on to the property ladder. Scottish Government's latest housing statistics has revealed that housing completions across all 10 years in Scotland are still below pre-COVID levels. So we're not building the homes that Scotland needs, and that's something we should all be concerned about. At the same time, SNP and Green Ministers have also now closed off two crucial support schemes for first-time buyers, with the scrapping of Help to Buy and the First Home Fund as well. First-time buyers in England can still access this support of shared ownership and get, them on, get themselves onto the property ladder. And I think that's really important. Yes, Cabinet very section. briefly. So, so given the figure that, um, that Ben McPherson used, around 80% of beneficiaries would have been able to purchase a property without government support, is Miles Briggs saying that we should take money out of the affordable housing supply programme, which helps people who could not afford either their own home or in terms of a rented home, uh, to put it in to help to buy instead? I think we need clarity from Miles Briggs Miles on that. Briggs. I think it's quite clear who the Cabinet Secretary doesn't want to help, and it's who she sees as the super rich, like nurses, like police officers, like teachers in our country. They want support, Cabinet Secretary. I don't have time, I've only got four minutes. But this is where we need 
need to see the government actually looking at this because they used to support wanting to help Scots get in the property ladder. They've changed their mind and they've turned their backs on the very people they used to support. Now, Scottish Conservatives want to make sure that home ownership is affordable for every Scot, and that's important. That's why we're proposing a rent-to-own scheme, which will help people save for a deposit by giving them a percentage of their rent back when they decide and are ready to purchase their own home. And it's clear that more and more potential first-time buyers across Scotland are being priced out of the market, especially here in the capital. Scottish first-time buyers must be at the heart of a Scottish Government housing strategy, and sadly we now see the Scottish Government seems to have forgotten about them. That's why my amendment for today's uh, debate calls on Ministers to reinstate the Help to Buy scheme and develop a new rent-to-own scheme. We need a bold new initiative to help people get onto the property ladder in Scotland, and rent-to-own can do just that. Deputy President Officer, a generation of potential first-time buyers are at risk of now being completely left behind by this SNP Green Government. That's not acceptable. It's clear also that we are starting to see the unintended consequences of the impact of the SNP Green Labour rent controls bill yeah. and how that is filtering through into our social rented sector. Yeah, yeah. All of us are meeting with these sectors and seeing how they are redrawing their financial future plans. That will result in the scrapping of future business plans for new socially rented homes, which will ultimately result in fewer homes available. That will be the legacy of this SNP Green government. I've not got the time, sorry, I've only got a few seconds left. That is also why these benches believe it's time to take forward new schemes to provide the support which our social rented uh, and the tenant the properties need as well. For too long they have been neglected and the rent controls bill we will see also fewer private rented properties. Here in the capital that will be a total disaster and something all parties in this chamber who supported that legislation uh, must take responsibility for. To conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, Scottish Conservatives have a robust plan to support our first-time buyers. It's time SNP and Greens and the Labour Party matched that ambition. Thank you. Thank you, Mr Briggs. I now call Alex Cole-Hamilton for uh, up to four minutes. Mr Cole-Hamilton. Thank you very much indeed, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'm pleased to rise for my party to speak in this important debate. I congratulate Mark Griffin for securing time for it. It is undeniable that the cost of loan crisis is having a huge impact on the budgets of households right across this country. The Conservative government's disastrous mini-budget under Trust and Quarteng has brought utter chaos in the markets and exacerbated the crisis at the worst possible moment. And it is left to ordinary people to pick up the pieces and pay the price. Presiding officer, dreadful conservative mismanagement of the economy has caused mortgages to absolutely skyrocket. And recent estimates, we've heard some of them today, suggest a typical family will see a staggering annual increase of around £3,000 in their mortgage payments when they come to renegotiate their deals. Struggling households face a crippling triple whammy in the form of rising food costs, energy bills and housing costs, in, in particular in mortgages. And this month, a poll revealed homeowners are worried about defaulting on their payments or being forced to cut down on food bills, while one in four even fear losing those homes due to unpaid bills. It's hard to overstate the toll that that sort of worry can have and it must take. When people are struggling so much that some even face the threat of homelessness, it is appalling that we are yet again in the middle of an unwanted independence merry-go-round. Instead of making sure vulnerable Scots make it through the winter with their homes and their health intact, this SNP and Green Government is yet again wasting its energy and our time, our focus on more failed att attempts and efforts to break up our United Kingdom. That is tedious, it is arrogant, it is morally indefensible. And the people of Scotland are trapped between Tory incompetence at Westminster and SNP green disinterest at Holyrood. People need to know that they can heat their homes, feed their children, afford their bills. By extending the reach of homeowner support fund to ensure it is fit to address inflation and the rise in interest rates, we can offer them some help. I don't have very much time, but Fulton McGregor. Fulton McGregor, briefly. Yeah, I thank the member for uh, the intervention. He's talking about independence here. I know that he, he doesn't like independence. He doesn't want to vote for independence, but will he not at least accept that independence gives people a choice to escape from these policies that he stood up there and criticised. Alex Cole-Hamilton. 
I think, I think this is the, the great snake oil that the SNP are trying to sell us, that this is somehow an antidote to all the problems we face. It would compound all of the misery and the economic cost to families, hardworking families across this country. And while it is well past time, Deputy Presiding Officer, the, the UK Government brought in a proper windfall tax on the profits made by the banking sector. We successfully along with others, dragged the UK government to the point where they levied a windfall tax on the super profits made by oil and gas producers. So too now must we look to the banking sector, because at a time when people are in risk of losing their homes because of the mortgage repayments exacted on them by the banks that they are lended to or lended from, uh, we see the UK government initiating a tax break of £18 billion through the banking levy on those profits. That is unconscionable and should be reversed. That is how you pay for these measures. And we've been calling for them since October last year, but the government, the UK government, has not gone far enough. Instead of making sure banks pay their share, they are happy to impose years of painful stealth taxes on ordinary families. Presiding officer, people deserve much better than this. We in this parliament are duty bound to ensure our focus is squarely on the issues that make a material difference to the lives of those people we are here to serve. That is why Liberal Democrats believe that all of those who have seen their mortgage payments increase by a significant amount should be able to access a welfare support fund for grants to help cover some of the cost of that rise. That would protect families from falling into arrears or losing their homes, and it is the right thing to do. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed, Mr Cole Hamilton. Uh, we now move to the open debate. I call firstly Paul Sweeney to be followed by Fulton McGregor uh, for up to four minutes. Mr Sweeney. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. We find ourselves again debating the cost of living crisis, and I'd like to thank my own front bench for bringing the topic back to the Chamber again today, because it is so critical to people across Scotland. It is the most important topic of conversation bar none. It impacts on each and every one of our constituents, regardless of their financial circumstances, but there can be no doubt that the poorest and most vulnerable will be disproportionately affected. We have an economy that has flatlined, a government that has run out of ideas, and a UK policy landscape that takes us back to George Osborne's austerity agenda. And as we look set to embark on austerity 2.0, it's important that we consider what that will mean for our economy and for our people in the years to come. The Office of Budget Responsibility estimate that the measures outlined in the Chancellor's budget last week will result in a 7% drop in household incomes over the next two years, culminating in the biggest fall in living standards since records began. That is six decades. The OECD predict that the British economy will contract by 0.4% of GDP next year and is already in recession, with Russia being the only other advanced economy in the world predicted to perform worse. And as the Joseph Rowntree Foundation have issued a stark warning that next year some people in the UK could be up to £538 worse off than they are this year. We have also seen warnings that we could be about to witness unemployment surpassing half a million by the end of 2024 with the economic and social consequences that will have for our communities. The worst part of all, Deputy Presiding Officer, is that we have already tried austerity economics. The Tories embarked on it in 2010 only for it to deliver flatlining growth, stagnating productivity, while eroding the wages and conditions of working people. And we all know the human impact it had too. We saw it firsthand in Glasgow, with recent research from the University of Glasgow and the Glasgow Centre for Population Health concluding that over 330,000 excess deaths can be linked to the austerity programme pursued by the British Government over the 2010 to 2017 period. That is a grotesque failure of public policy and one that cannot be allowed to be repeated. Deputy Presiding Officer, we are also in the frankly perverse situation where those who lauded the tax cutting, high spending mini budget of Truss and Quarteng are now in the exact same people who are triumphantly applauding the tax raising austerity imposing autumn budget of Sunak and Hunt. It's politicking at its most cynical and voters won't forget it. Labour have proposed a series of alternatives for our economy and a policy platform that stands in direct contrast to that outlined by the current Conservative government. We want to see a publicly owned energy generation company, something that both the Tories and the SNP have failed to implement, despite having over a decade to do so. We want to see the threshold for the top rate of income tax in Scotland drop from £150,000 a year to £120,000 a year, something that the government have yet to agree to. 
and we want to see a return of the mortgage to shared equity scheme that the motion refers to today. For all the reasons we have discussed, many of which I think the majority of us agree on, we need tangible action both in the short and the longer term. For too long we have looked at our economy as though we are accountants, shifting money from one portfolio to that portfolio without any real understanding of the economic impact and the economic multiplier effect that some of our decisions have. We need a real focus on public sector investment that will produce long-term growth in the public revenues, drive growth in our economy and produce the innovation that is vital for our productivity. It's abundantly clear that more of the same economic uh, austerity and the doom loop of decline that has been handed down to our communities for too long simply won't work, it has never worked and it will not be accepted by working people and it should not be accepted by this parliament. It is time to say enough is enough. Thank you, Mr Sweeney. I now call Fulton McGregor to be followed by Douglas Lumsden for in four minutes, uh, Mr McGregor. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. And once again, as my colleague Paul Sweeney just said, we're in this chamber to speak about a Tory-made financial crisis that is affecting people all across Scotland. The uncertainty and fear caused by the disastrous Brexit that Scotland didn't vote for and the catastrophic Tory mini-budget has had numerous financial consequences across the UK. Inflation has now risen yet again to 11.1%, which is up from 10.1% last month. This is now the highest it's been in my lifetime. The Bank of England have raised the base rate of interest by 0.75 percentage points to 3%, which is the single biggest increase in over three decades. And the budget not only crashed the pound sterling, but it put pensions at risk and, as we're here today to discuss, sent mortgage payments sky high. Not for the first time, the Scottish Government have had to end that policy to mitigate ways in which the UK Government have hit the most vulnerable in society. Free prescriptions, free higher education, free concessionary bus travel that now includes under-22s, free school meals and the recent Scot Scottish child payments are all examples of Scottish Government policies that have helped those who need it most. The Scottish Government's Home Homeowners Support Fund is another such scheme that is unique to Scotland. This fund helps those homeowners who run into financial difficulty and are at risk of losing their homes. The Mortgage to Shared Equity Scheme is one such method that support fund where the Scottish Government buys a stake of up to 30 per cent for an individual's property, and this allows the homeowner to reduce their secured loan. This scheme is dependent on the applicant's eligibility criteria, but the Scottish Government, as the Cabinet Secretary has said, are looking at reviewing the fund, including this criteria. I do not think I am going to have time, Mr Briggs, sorry. In addition to these supports, the Scottish Government are investing an additional £12.5 million to provide free advice services to help people with income maximisation and welfare and debt advice. In the short time I have had so far, I have only scratched the surface of the ways in which the Scottish Government is doing everything it can to help those affected by the cost of living crisis. But unfortunately, it is evident that Scotland does not currently have the independent fiscal powers that are required to address this crisis more appropriately. To build a more prosperous and fairer future Scotland, for Scotland, independence is not only desirable, but it is now essential. And that is where I completely disagree with Alex Cole Hamilton. I am not going to take any interventions just now. And the Supreme Court ruling today, I think, puts beyond any doubt that we had that we are in a voluntary union, something that many of us have been saying for a while. Presiding officer, one of the reasons I have not taken, one of the reasons I've not taken any interventions, but I will see when I get to the, the, the course at the end, is because I want to spend the rest of my time paying tribute to some of the amazing local charities and individuals in my constituency who are working to help people deal with this Tory imposed cost of living crisis. And I think it's important we come to the Chamber and do that. So my thanks to Julie and her team at Cool School Uniforms, to Angela and her team at the Coatbridge Food Bank in conjunction with the Severian Fathers, to Mags and all involved at the Moody's Bun Food Bank, and to Father Kane and those involved in the St Augustine Stay Connected project and the pantry, and to Willie and all the Kirkshaw's Neighbourhood Centre team, and Teresa and her team at Glen Boyd Life Centre. These services provide food, clothing, support activities and even warm hubs and all these organisations tell me they are getting more and more referrals, but ironically, less donations. And what is important in the context of this motion is they are getting more and more people who have got mortgages, struggling with mortgages, and more and more people who are in employment and in poverty, working poverty. Yeah, I, I, OK. Mark Griffin. I appreciate you will have many constituents who are struggling with a mortgage. Does he think those constituents who are struggling can wait until this review runs up until the spring to get any help? Fulton McGregor. I think, as I have said already, Mr Griffin, I think, and, and, and I appreciate you bringing this motion forward because I think that it is important. The Scottish Government are doing a lot. I have already listed just some of them. We are, we are trying, but all this Parliament is doing at times, or what it feels like, is mitigating 
is mitigating what the, what the Tories are, are bringing forward. And Labour, you should really be standing beside us at every opportunity and calling it out. And that brings me uh, to my, uh, my final points, President officer. I just want to thank all of these uh, organisations that I mentioned there. But they shouldn't need to do this. This Tory government are taking us all for granted, relying on this Scottish government, councils and kind-hearted charities and individual, individuals to pick up the mess that they have created. And I'll end exactly where my colleague before me did. Enough is enough. Thank you very much, uh, Mr McGregor. And I call Douglas Lumsden to be followed by Mary McNair uh, for up to four minutes. Mr Lumsden. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Um, once again, we come to this Parliament to discuss this vital issue. And it's right that we're spending a great deal of time on it, as this is the matter that's uppermost in the minds of our constituents moving into the winter. And I agree with much of the Labour motion today that something needs to be done. And this SNP Green devolved government have not done enough to help those in Scotland. In fact, their latest rent freeze will add to this issue as social landlords put their capital plans on hold. We would all much rather see the focus of this government on this issue and not the grievance politics of independence. You can always tell a government's focus by its budget priorities. In Westminster, we have a government that is invested in health, education and capital projects. In Scotland, we have a government that sets money aside for independence and fake foreign embassies. Our UK government is focused on protecting the most vulnerable, protecting services and ensuring that the tax burden is shared among us all, but borne by the most highest earners. And I welcome the measures in the autumn statement. I will have time later, Daniel. Um, the key to helping mortgage payers in Scotland is to bring down inflation, to build growth and to ensure stability in our economy. And that is what Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt are focused on. And that is what the autumn statement demonstrates. And inflation is rising across the world. The UK's latest inflation rate is 11.1%. This is lower than countries like the Netherlands, where the inflation rate is 16.8%, Belgium, where it's 13.1%, Germany, 11.6%, Italy, 12.6%. In fact, the EU as a whole has an inflation rate of 11.5%, according to the Euro indicators published just last week. But of course, the nationalists don't like to hear that inflation is a global problem. It suits their separatist agenda to tell people that it's a UK problem and only separation is the answer. I'll give way to Daniel now. Daniel Johnson, briefly. I, I'm very grateful for the member going, and he's right about the nationalists and the record, but he has to therefore acknowledge the consequences of guilt going up to 4.5%, what that has done for mortgage rates, as a direct result of Liz Truss's decisions, who I believe he supported in the leadership race for the Conservative Douglas. Party. I, I accept part of that, Daniel, but what, um, what you have to admit is that interest rates and inflation rates are rising right across the, the world. So to try and lay the blame at uh, the, the, the foot of Diamond Street is just not on. Of course, part of the issue with rising house prices and rising rents is this government's abject failure in ensuring an adequate supply of new housing in our communities. When I was leader of Aberdeen City Council, we launched the biggest council house building scheme in a generation, while the SNP government missed their targets year after year. More must be done, and this devolved SNP Green government have the powers to help. And after today's Supreme Court ruling, they have an extra 20 million in next year's budget to help. From its launch in 2013, they helped to buy Scotland scheme. I have no time, sorry. The Help to Buy Scotland scheme was being used by thousands of new home buyers and in June 2020, only two years ago, the then Housing Minister Kevin Stewart announced that the Scottish Government was pledging a further £55 million in order to assist a further 2,000 purchases. But when the news broke that it was to be scrapped, Nicola Barclay, Chief Executive of Homes for Scotland, described the move as devastating. All we hear from this Government is blame politics but it's always been someone else's fault. Apparently, independence would solve all our ills and the cost of living crisis. This is living in cloud cuckoo land. This is a global issue that requires governments to work together to solve it. The looming crisis in our housing sector comes after years of neglect from this SNP government. This failed SNP Green coalition of chaos must do more. They have to start investing in Scotland, investing in our housing stock, invest in our local communities, invest in our hard work and local government and invest in the future of Scotland as part of the United Kingdom. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr Lumsden. I call Marie McNair to be followed by Ariane Burgess for up to four minutes, Ms McNair. Thank you, President Officer. I'm pleased to speak in this debate about the Westminster-imposed cost of living crisis. 
It is a time of great concern for many of my constituents who are struggling to get by and provide the basics for their families. The Tories' disastrous mini-budget that they called on the Scottish Government to copy has created a terrifying situation for many. It has made their difficult financial outlook even worse. As the motion points out, this is putting immense pressure on households with a mortgage. I spoke to a constituent recently who has a variable rate mortgage. She described the fear experienced each time a letter from a mortgage provider arrives. And of course, it is never good news in the letter. Always bad and little options available to assist. We must do everything we can to help those with mortgages. And that is why I welcome that the Scottish Government is already reviewing the eligibility criteria of Homeowner Support Fund. Also, the DWP scheme for support for mortgage interest loans does not provide adequate help to those on universal credit. It is welcome that in the Westminster Budget Statement it was announced that for universal credit claimants the waiting period before claiming will be reduced from nine months to three. The removal of the earnings bar to claiming is also welcome. However, none of this is due to happen until spring. It makes no sense to wait until spring to do this when homeowners need our help now. So I call on Labour and Tory members to join me in calling for the changes to be brought in immediately, allowing help to be accessed now. Uh, I've actually got a lot to get through, so uh, no. Also, the budget statement should have done so much more. It was a missed opportunity to provide the help needed to mitigate against the cost of living crisis. Instead, it kept the five-week waiting universal credit that is forcing people to go into debt. The two-child policy was a born rape clause. The bedroom tax and the benefit cap need millions of pounds for mitigation. Instead, to just give one example, it should have matched our Scottish child payment with the Child Poverty Action Group saying if the Scottish Government can make this kind of serious investment in protecting our children from poverty, then so can the UK Government. No, it was more of the same from the Westminster Government. No compassion, no radical game-changing policies. In fact, Torsten uh, Bell from the Resolution Foundation said the Tories have delivered a budget statement with the policies of Gordon Brown. It's my party that is usually accused of saying that there is no difference between the Tories and Labour. And we are seeing evidence that this may be true. We know that this cost of living crisis has been made worse by Brexit. This extreme Tory Brexit now policy of the Scottish Labour Party is an unmitigated disaster for our country. Scotland's economy has been hammered by it and is hitting people's pockets badly. MPs were told just last week by the, the member of the Bank of England Monetary Committee that Brexit have added 6% to food prices. Back in June, the respected think tank, the Resolution Foundation, said the average worker was on, on course to suffer over £470 in lost earnings each year by 2030. So this is what the Tories and the Scottish Labour Party have to offer the cost of living crisis, further misery and hardship fuelled by their Brexit policies. The UK economy is in crisis. The new age of Tory austerity is on its way. Scotland deserves better than this, and that's why Scottish independence is now essential. Thank you, Ms McNair. I now call Ariane Burgess to be followed by Alec Rowley for up to four minutes. Ms Burgess. Thank you. Deputy Presiding Officer, the cost of home ownership is severely out of kilter with reality when it comes to the money people earn and the amount they are able to save. Over the last year, the Bank of England base rate has increased from 0.1% to 3%, the sharpest increase in a generation and the highest rate since the 2008 financial crisis. When interest rates were briefly 14.8% in October 1989, also under Tory economic mismanagement, the average Scottish home cost around £35,000. It's now £195,000. Average weekly wages have barely doubled over the same period. At the same time, individuals who have inherited wealth or property have seen their net worth accumulate at pace without those property values being taxed leading to ever higher prices despite depressed wages. This has embedded wealth inequality and means in rural areas like the Highlands and Islands especially, the prospect of owning a home or even renting one affordably becomes ever more dis distant for young people. For years, Labour and Tory governments have insisted on fueling buyer demand 
while failing to address the, severe, the severe reality of the housing crisis by building more affordable homes, pushing house prices to record highs. Add in the inflationary effects of years of cheap buy-to-let mortgages, banking deregulation, and the disaster I don't have time to give away, sorry. Uh, and the disastrous right to buy policy, thankfully now ended in Scotland, decimating social housing, and it is not hard to see why house prices have spiralled. Factor in inflation, low wage growth, wage inequality, and rising rates, and the outlook becomes even more bleak. Deputy Presiding Officer, the pain caused by skyrocketing bills, soaring prices, record inflation, and the reckless Brexit that both Labour and the Tories support is just starting to be felt in people's wallets when they go to the shops, consume energy in the home, and fill up with fuel. It's bad now. It will sadly get worse. Uh, sorry, I need to keep on. In Scotland, with Greens in government, we are choosing a different path, as well as the recently passed cost of living bill, which supports renters. We are addressing the housing crisis through discretionary housing payments to mitigate the financial triple whammy faced by those on low incomes. The unfair bedroom tax, reductions in housing allowance, and the introduction of the benefit cap. We're also looking to the future with our ambitious commitment to build 110,000 homes by 2030, with 11,000 of these in rural areas and 70% of the whole 110,000 set to be affordable, and to support homeowners to reduce their fuel bill through energy efficiency measures. Presi Deputy Presiding Officer, I welcome the Scottish Government's review of eligibility for the fund, but we must all acknowledge the sad reality that as more homeowners come to the end of fixed rate deals, the impact of the Tory Government's reckless behaviour and financial illiteracy will only increase. It's clear that, the Westminster, that Westminster is not working for Scotland or our economy, and without the full fiscal levers of an independent country, we can barely begin to challenge the enormous social inequality that the housing and fiscal policies of both Labour and the Tory governments have created. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Alec Rowley to be followed by Alexander Stewart. Mr Rowley, for up to four minutes. President Officer, there are few misguided statements that I have heard in this, this debate today. I mean, Mary McNair attacks uh, Labour, but she seems to forget that when Labour were in power, they lifted over 2.5 million children and pensioners out of poverty. And if you go back and look at that record, and look at, look at the, the approach, the, there was actually a greater redistribution of wealth took place over that period than, than had done at any time. So, so it's easy to stand up here and make comments attacking other people without the facts, but we should focus on the facts because out there in the real world, the big issue today is not the Constitution of Scotland. The big issue is that people are sitting worried terrified about how they're going to get through this winter and how they're going to get through the cost 11 crisis. And talking about being deluded, I would have to say the deluded comments for Douglas Lumsden is, is just to completely deny the situation that we find ourselves in. This crisis is created by the Tory party in Downing Street. You firstly a crash, crash the economy, crash the economy in terms of a budget that is clearly going to drive up interest rates, is driving up mortgages and is frightening people and why Labour are saying we need action now, not in the future, but now. Shona Robinson says that we are conducting a review, and Ben McPherson refers to that as well. Well, that's great. I hope you will include other parties in that discussion. But we've not got months and months and months to wait on a review. What we actually need to do is take the action now so that those people who are sitting terrified, if they reach the point where the only option for them is to lose their house, as Mark said, Griffin says that's the point where we should step in. Cabinet Secretary, briefly. I was just going to say to, to Alec Rowley that the review is ongoing. It's not 
it has already been underway. And what I'm saying is it will be concluded in the spring. And it's important to get it right to make sure it's going to actually help that wider group of people that may need help over the coming months. Alec Rowley. I agree it's important to get it right, but I hope Cabinet Secretary will agree that there is a certain urgency to that. And to the Scottish Tories, if you really want to do something to stand up for the poorest in Scotland, reject Tory austerity, because we've not got over the last round of Tory austerity, and that also leads to and led to many of the problems that we have in Scotland. Yep. He, he, started, Bird, he started his contribution looking for facts. So the UK government budget provides an extra £1.5 billion for Scotland's public services. Does he not acknowledge that's additional money for the services we all care about? Alec Rowley. The UK, the UK government is a direct, a direct result of the crash budget. Inflation has shot up, taking £180 billion immediately out of the Scottish budget. So we have that problem directly coming from failed Tory policy. But I would, I would say that we are talking about housing here. I would have to say that we're not building enough houses. Is it not heartbreaking? I, I'm sure I'm not the only MSP in this chamber that has people coming to their office week after week after week and not able to get housing. So we need to build far more houses. We need a national house build programme for Scotland. And that would be a position that No, be Mr Rowley, you're, you're winding up, I'm afraid. So, so what I would say is the Mental Health Foundation, in conclusion, they sent a briefing that every MSP should read. People are frightened. People are concerned. We need this Parliament to come together, not put counter motions and, 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 and amendments, but come together. Let's start talking about what the immediate priority should be in Scotland. And it should be that nobody loses their house. Part of that, through Mercedes Viela, was pushing for the rent freeze has been put in place, but the next part of that is the proposal that Mark Griffin's put forward. Let's work together. Let's ensure that nobody in Scotland is evicted this winter and nobody loses their house because of Thank failed you, Mr. Tory Rowley. economic Alexander policies. Alexander Stewart to be followed by Colin Beatty for up to four minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am grateful for the opportunity once again to debate the ongoing cost of living crisis, and I support the amendment in the name of Miles Briggs. Today's motion talks about the challenges many people are facing, including higher mortgage repayments, social rented properties, first-time buyers and home support funds. It also quite rightly points out that the Scottish Government should be using every lever of power that it has at its disposal to help these people through many of these challenges. Along with my colleagues on these benches, I have been clear that the cost of living crisis is a problem that must be tackled for all directions and is a responsibility for all levels of government. Last week, we saw the UK government set its plans out on when it continues to support people through this crisis. And I am sure, like all aside, this chamber would agree that this is an economic climate uh, which in countries around the world are facing significant challenges and are having to take difficult decisions as a result. In spite of these challenges, last week's autumn statement showed us that the UK government is continuing to do what it can to provide further support. And as my party's... Of course. Stuart McMillan. I uh, thank Alexander Stewart for taking the intervention. Would you agree with me that, that the, the issue of inflation is certainly not going to help any housing, any registered social landlord to actually build more homes? And that's a problem that's actually been caused mostly by his government in London. As, as we've Stewart. already heard today, inflation is an international event. And you've already heard that inflation in other parts of Europe and across the world are higher than they are here in the United Kingdom. I am sure, as I said, that nobody will uh, look at the significant challenges that we are facing and, and look at the decisions that we need to manage. And as I said, the autumn statement showed that the United Kingdom is, is, is managing forward. And as my party spokesman for older people, I echo comments made by Age Scotland as they were much to welcome within the autumn statement that pensions triple lock is being much needed and security for householders. And that would, uh, re the people rely on estate pension and income and further cost of living payments to all pensioners' households 
householders will be provided for key support. It should also be welcomed that the energy price guarantee has now been extended to April 2024. While the price of energy over the coming years remains somewhat uncertain, uh, current estimates predict that extending support will ensure that the tune of around £12 billion. While this type of universal support is closely monitored, we have to see what will happen with the climate as we move forward. As the economic situation continues to develop, it will be important for the UK Government to keep an eye and support was under review, and I look forward to ensuring that that is the case. I have already made it clear that the SNP Government should be using every power at its disposal to ensure that people receive support. It is much welcome that this call, the Scottish Child Payment has been finally agreed uh, and that is eligible for any child up to the age of 16 at the new higher rate of £25 per week. This payment will be a great support to many families over the coming months, which will, is why we all supported that within this chamber. However, it is clear that more can still be done on the part of the Scottish Government. A further cost of living support fund for the most vulnerable families could be a great help for many over the winter, and this could no doubt be funded as part of the £20 million currently earmarked for what was an independence referendum. So, in conclusion, Presiding Officer, it is clear that the situation uh, to this ongoing crisis will be one which sees both of Scotland's governments working together, and they need to work together to ensure that. The Scottish Government has no shortage of powers to lean on, and as we've seen today, there is no shortage of ideas when it comes to ensuring that individuals are supported. People across Scotland expect these powers to be used to tackle the issues that really matter to them, and it is high time that their expectations became a reality. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, and I call Colin Beattie, the final speaker in the open debate. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I thank Mr Griffin for bringing this motion to Parliament. The issue is indeed an important one. But at the very beginning, let me say it seems a strange motion for the Labour Party to bring before the Scottish Parliament, which has no locus over mortgage interest rates, which are of course a reserved matter. And they can only offer a very limited support to home buyers within a severely constrained budget. But perhaps the Chamber would benefit from a quick refresh of, hist of the history of where this crisis really started. The current situation faced by mortgage holders lies in the disastrous financial crash presided over by the Labour Party in 2008-10. Yes. Gordon Brown, as, the longest serving, uh, as a long-serving UK challenger, Chancellor of the Exchequer and later PM, followed a Tory-style lazy fare attitude to the nation's finances and allowed unbridled greed and naked rapacity to run amok and unchecked. The result was inevitable, a financial crash which we, the taxpayers, bailed out at huge expense. In 2008, the national debt stood at £800 billion. By 2010, it had risen to £1.2 trillion. It now stands at £2.4 trillion. The Tories, of course, taking over from Labour, failed to focus on economic recovery. Since then, we have faced tough austerity measures, which many across the country have suffered from. However, let's be clear, the Tories have only built on the foundations Labour laid. Economic incompetence has been prevalent under both Labour and Tory governments to an extent which is breathtaking. And this is why we are here today. This is why households are being pushed into poverty with sky-high mortgage interest rates. This is why households are having to make the tough decisions between heating and eating this winter. To emphasise to the Chamber, Scotland does not have the full financial powers it needs, but it is still doing more than any government in the four nations of the UK to offer the best support to low-income households, and offers the only scheme of its kind in the UK, the Homeowners Support Fund, to support those who face difficulties paying their mortgage or face repossession. And I welcome the Scottish Government reviewing the fund, including the eligibility rules, in the light of the cost of living crisis. Just recently, the Scottish Government again led the way, increasing the Scottish Child Payment, only available in Scotland, increasing the payment to £25 per week for eligible households. Anti-poverty campaigners described this as a watershed moment for tackling poverty in Scotland and stated that the rest of the UK should take notice. Unfortunately, it appears the Chancellor chose to ignore these calls in his autumn statement, and this shows a clear choice not to help the most vulnerable households, which is an incredibly cruel decision. 
The Scottish Government has committed almost £3 billion this financial year to mitigate the burden of the cost of living crisis on household budgets. These measures have been taken at the same time as maintaining free prescriptions, free school meals and free concessionary bus travel, which this year was extended to under 22s. Households in Scotland benefit from the most generous social contract in any part of the UK. To conclude, Presiding Officer, Scotland should not have to suffer because of the damaging choices both Labour and Tory governments have made over too many years. Only with full fiscal powers can the Scottish Government tackle this cost of living crisis fully. I think it's clear now more than ever, Scottish independence is the only viable option to ensure we put a complete end to the destructive path this Tory Government is leading us down, ably assisted by their Labour Party acolytes. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to closing speeches and I call on Liz Smith. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I thank Labour for uh, bringing this debate to the Chamber as I believe that the public really does want us as a Parliament to concentrate on the issues that matter most to them. And the cost of living is undoubtedly the biggest priority as was set out in the research from the David Hume Institute published yesterday. And I say that in the middle of a two-week period of parliamentary business, which, uh, presiding officer, I understand there have been concerns expressed on all sides about the lack of government statements on crucial issues like the teachers' strike, uh, about ambulance staff, about the two-tier NHS dental provision, <laughs> and on a day, obviously, where the focus has been yet again on the Constitution. So even if we have vastly different political views from the Labour Party, we do support them in bringing this issue to the Chamber. Now, several members have rightly expressed their concerns about the current state of affairs with regard to the economy. Just as the OBR has been blunt in its economic analysis of the fragility of the economy, particularly when it comes to the erosion of living standards and the projections of low growth and productivity, and the fact that, sadly, there is little optimism that the current situation will be short-lived. <coughs> the Chancellor has been blunt in his analysis with an honesty that I welcome in relation to previous budget statements and clear that there has to be a completely different focus in terms of protect, protecting those on the lowest incomes and placing greater tax burdens on those with broader shoulders. And that's not easy to say as a Conservative, but I believe it's the right thing to do. Alexander Stewart in his speech commented on the cautious welcome which was given uh, to this focus in the autumn statement by age concern, particularly when it comes to the retention of the triple lock and the energy price guarantee being extended to 2024. And it is fair, and, and I think it was uh, Fulton McGregor who um, made the point about the Scottish Government having the uplift in the child payment to address more issues. He's absolutely uh, right, because that can be extremely helpful. But when it comes to uh, Labour's perspective in this debate, Alex Rowley in particular, and actually um, on the SNP, I think it was Mary McNair, the, the interest rate aspect of the cost of living situation is not solely down to problems with the UK government. Problems, incidentally, which I did acknowledge in the last cost of living debate, were part of the issue, but they are not the sole problem at all. They are down to global trends, which actually stretch back to the early part of 20. And if, if you don't mind just, just now, can I just finish this po point? Down to the global trends which stretch back to the early part of 2021 when the central banks in many emerging markets <coughs> uh, make clear that they were not going to do anything other but raise their interest rates. And that was followed by the uh, more advanced economies in the latter part of 2021. And I know that... Um, the member will have looked at the IMF analysis, which uh, clarifies that point. It is not just solely down to the, to the UK government that we've got this problem. This is a global situation. So I give way to the member. Daniel Johnson. And I'm very grateful. But, and the member would have to acknowledge that gilts at the start of this year were at 1%. They spiked 4.5% and they've not yet come below 3% for five years. And that's a major component of the cost of mortgages. And that is exclusively an issue for the UK. Liz Smith. But I acknowledge that. And I also acknowledge that in the previous debate. It is part of the issue, but it is not the sole issue. And I think it's incumbent on the other parties in this chamber to recognise that it is not the sole issue, because this is a global situation. If you look at all the economic analysis, which um, 
Mr Johnson and I have plenty of opportunity to do in the Finance Committee, it is very clear that these inflationary pressures are not something that was made just in this country. That's not true at all. I think I'm past my time, am I? Um, Ms Smith, it is past time, unfortunately. I'm past, past, past my time. But I, I just want to finish on this point, Presiding Officer. This is a serious issue. I do believe very firmly that the public want us to be focused very much in this Parliament on this problem, but let's keep it in perspective in terms of the facts that are available and the economic analysis that we have to hand. This is not just a problem that has been made in the UK, far from it, and I'm very happy to support the amendment in the name of Miles Briggs. Thank you. I call on Shona Robertson. Uh, thank you, President Officer. Uh, let me first welcome uh, this debate and welcome ideas across the Chamber. And I think Alex Rowley was quite right to call for us to work together where we can, and I will certainly uh, attempt to do that, whether it's on this issue or other issues. Um, let me start with the, the record on uh, affordable housing delivery. The Scottish Government has, by all of the facts available, led the way across the UK with almost 113,000 affordable homes now delivered since 2007. And that's important because all of the poverty and, um, bodies that analyse these things say it's the key reason that child poverty levels are lower in Scotland because of that affordable housing delivery. Over 79,000 have, have been for social rent, uh, including over 19,000 council homes, a £3.6 billion pounds a package of investment uh, this parliamentary term has been made available, I will in a second, towards the delivery of affordable homes so that we can continue that important work we started in two 2007. And also, we've helped 19,000 households into home ownership since uh, 2007. I'll give way briefly. Daniel Johnson. I'm very grateful to the Minister for, for giving way. And I acknowledge the point she makes about affordable housing, but in totality, house building across all sectors has still to really recover from the 2008 crash. And in terms of affordability for housing, that overall supply is important, is it not? Cabinet the Secretary. overall supply is important, and uh, Daniel Johnson will be aware that part of the, the issue is the post-COVID recovery of the construction sector, inflation, interest rates, all impacting on all sectors of, of house building. That makes it really difficult to make sure we get as much value out of that £3.6 billion, which of course is grown by uh, RSLs and, and local authorities in making uh, that, that package go further. But let me say it is an understatement to say that the Tories lack credibility in this area. With total denial of responsibility, clearly the briefing sheets for today's debate said something like talk about global issues and uh, global factors, shift the blame. Well, you know, the, sh the blame cannot be shifted because whether it's their responsibility for soaring interest rates and what that means for mortgage holders or whether it's their own uh, delivery in terms of the UK Tory government's delivery on affordable housing, the, the truth is they have no credibility on this. This is a, a Tory caused cost of living crisis and people will have to pick up the pieces. Well, just a minute, uh, I'll let you in once I've uh, outlined what the, uh, Miles Briggs' government has uh, been delivering on affordable homes because for the last four years, Scotland has seen 62% more affordable homes delivered per head of population than in England where the oh. Tories are in power. Nine times as many social rented homes delivered per head of population and that has led to some terrible cases being raised recently about appalling housing conditions in England. If Miles Briggs wants to explain why that is compared to the record of delivery here then I'll let him in on that point. On appalling housing uh, standards I think the Cabinet Secretary should start looking in the mirror. Here in the capital we have the record number of children living in temporary accommodation on her watch she should hang her head in shame for that alone but let me tell you what's happening in UK government because we've seen 1.5 billion pounds in additional money for public services we protected the triple lock we're increasing benefits in line with inflation we're raising the national living wage to 10 pounds 42 per hour capping energy bills to 2024 that is a record to be proud of I think the cabinet secretary should start thinking about her own responsibilities briefly in closing the UK 
government has an appalling record on affordable housing delivery, and Miles Briggs knows it. And as for uh, investment, inflation has ripped £1.7 billion worth of investment out of this Scottish Government's uh, uh, budget availability. And Miles Briggs talks about investment in affordable housing and temporary accommodation, but he wants to then take money out of the affordable housing supply programme and put it in to helping the better off purchase their homes. And he needs to explain how he can, uh, how he can explain to people in this city why he wants to do that at must their conclude, expense, Cabinet Secretary. I'm sorry, the Cabinet Secretary must conclude now. Thank yeah. you. So, in, Thank you. In, I'm sorry, we're well over time. We must conclude. OK, in Thank conclusion, you. Uh, no, this cost crisis is impacting on everyone. Cabinet Secretary, I must ask you to conclude. Uh, is something we will review, and we will be happy to work with others in doing that. Thank you. And I call on Daniel Johnson to wind up. Thank you uh, very much, Presiding Officer. At the beginning of this debate, I was reflecting on my colleague, uh, Mark Griffin, that this was a somewhat more tempered debate than the, the previous one, but it clearly livened up towards the end, and rightly so, because there is no important, more important issue than housing. So much of what we do in here actually ultimately hinges on access to affordable housing. And so in terms of the contributions, the, I can actually think of no better contribution than point members to than that of Alec Rowley who gave an impassioned uh, uh, statement of why this is urgent. Because people are facing very real, and for many people, very new pressures. And I think this is why we brought forward this debate, because the cost of living crisis is affecting all sorts of people, and people who might not have expected themselves to be facing the challenges that they are doing. I have to say that that includes us. I mean, I have to say that I, I returned home yesterday to look at my smart meter at horror, to see that it was registering at £12 was my total utility charges for the second day running because of the, the, the effect of the weather. How many, and I, we, I can afford that, it's not pleasant, it's, it's not something I look forward to, but I can. But that replicated all over this country. And what does that mean in terms of people keeping a roof over their head? And what we have is an opportunity here, a policy sitting on the books ready-made that can help people, and is right now doing nothing. As Mark Griffin pointed out, the mortgage to equity scheme has not had a successful application since 2016. So I, I appreciate the government and their constructive comments, both from uh, Ben McPherson and from Shona Robertson, about the the, 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 this as a, a proposition. But I ask them to act with more urgency. And I say that for this simple reason. Over the next two quarters, we will see approximately, based on Bank of England data, 60,000 Scots see their two-year fixes come to an end and have to remortgage. 60,000 people suddenly facing the reality of increased utility bills and increased mortgage bills. And so we need that help urgently. For those people, they may not be able to wait until the spring. So absolutely, we need to review. But the review has been going on since the summer. We could make changes right now that might be able to help those same people. And that is what we are asking here today. But I do have to say to the Conservatives, and while I appreciate the candour of some of the, 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 the comments, they really do need to face a reality check. Listening to some of the members here banging on about inflation, yes, there are global issues around inflation. But let's, as Alec Rowley asked us, look at the facts. Guilt spiked by the largest single daily increase in yields for five-year gilts than they had since Black Wednesday. Those, those costs of borrowing directly impact the ability for mortgage providers to provide products. That is why we saw almost 1,000 mortgages get taken off the market on the day of the mini-budget. And so we've heard a lot about the autumn statement. We've not heard so much over there about the mini-budget. And I think a little bit of contrition from the Tory benches would go a long way. Because there are some things that I would like to hold up and praise them for. I think Miles Briggs was absolutely right to talk about total housing supply. We have frankly struggled to achieve the levels that we were achieving consistently in Scotland of around 27, 28,000 completions per year prior to the financial crash. And we quite simply have never achieved that since. And we saw some actually encouragement pre-COVID, but those issues around housing supply uh, uh, pre-existed COVID, and we have to look at the totality of supply. I'd happily give way to Mars Briggs. In the I thank the member Briggs. for taking this intervention. He, like me, will be speaking to housing associations across uh, the region we represent. 
due to the rent controls bill, they are now looking at their investment portfolios and taking affordable housing projects out of future capital projects. That will be fewer homes for our constituents. Does he not acknowledge that, that is a mistake? Daniel Johnson. It was vital that we had urgent action to protect rents, to protect those facing the affordability crisis who are renting their housing. Now, absolutely, we will look, need to look at the spring because it's important. That, I, I think I've, I've, I've acknowledged the point, but we need to take both urgent action but also have the long-term solutions in place as well. And I would say to... to, to mem uh, uh, do I need to wind up, presiding officer? Uh, half a minute left. Yes. So I would say to some of the mentions, I think Fulton McGregor was absolutely right to raise those local charities in his constituency, because I've had those same conversations, whether it's with food banks or even local football clubs, who are seeking to provide the direct financial advice because they recognise that people need it, and quite often are people who have not had to seek that advice before. So it is urgent. But can I gently say to the SNP members, offering independence as a solution, what would happen? Mortgages held in sterling with a new currency facing an immediate devaluation, which their own advisors are saying is a very real risk. How does that help with the affordability of mortgages? So we need realistic propositions, not fantasy ones, and we need action now, not in the spring. Thank you very much, presiding officer. Thank you. That concludes the debate on cost of living mortgage rescue scheme. It's now time to move on to the next item of business.